Today, France's national rally celebrates a big first round win in parliamentary elections. Joe Biden vows to stay in the presidential race, and Bolivia's president is accused of faking last week's coup attempt. From TLDR News, this is your daily briefing for Monday the 1st of July, 2024. France's far-right national rally has won big at yesterday's high-turnout legislative elections, teeing up a high-stakes second-round vote scheduled for the end of this week on Sunday the 7th of July. Marine Le Pen's national rally came first, with 33% of the vote in the first round, far exceeding its 2022 legislative result and putting the party within reach of power for the first time. In a strong second place was the pan-left-wing New Popular Front Alliance, which secured 28% of the vote, while President Emmanuel Macron's centrist Ensemble Alliance won just 21%. Macron took a massive gamble by dissolving the National Assembly and calling snap elections last month, following his alliance's defeat at the European elections. For context, French legislative elections see voters elect the 577 members of the National Assembly across two rounds. Seats can be won in the first round if candidates win more than 50% of the vote in their seat, but most seats go through to a second round held a week later, featuring the top two candidates from the seat, plus any other candidate that received votes totaling at least 12.5% of the seat's registered electorate. The high turnout means that there were considerably more three-way races in the second round than usual, with some 244 seats heading to a second round featuring candidates from the National Rally, Ensemble and the New Popular Front. Responding to the results, Le Pen celebrated the win and called on voters to deliver her party an absolute majority in the second round. On the other side, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, whose France Unbowed party is the biggest in the left-wing New Popular Front alliance, urged any Popular Front candidates who had qualified for a runoff in third place to drop out in order to support whichever candidate is best placed to beat the national rally, stating not one vote, not one seat more for the national rally. This was a call also made by the other new Popular Front party leaders. Meanwhile, President Macron said, faced with the national rally, it's time for a large, clearly democratic and republican rally for the second round. While his Prime Minister, Gabriel Attal, said the far right is at the gates of power. Thus, our objective is clear, to prevent the national rally from getting elected in the second round. Atal added that this would involve the, quote, withdrawal of our candidates, whose remaining in third position would have led to the election of a candidate from the national rally over another candidate who, like us, defend the values of the republic. Projections based on the first round results suggest national rally could, but may not, win an outright majority in the National Assembly following the second round this week, though they are all but certain to be the largest party. There's more on the way, but remember to subscribe and ring the bell for more daily briefing tomorrow. Plus, if you want to support the channel like Tunde Salaru, then consider joining the new TLDR membership program for just $1.99. After a disastrous debate against Donald Trump last Thursday, it appears that President Joe Biden has decided to remain in the race. After meeting with family yesterday at Camp David, sources confirm that the president was encouraged by loved ones to remain and continue the campaign. Reportedly, it was Jill Biden, his wife, and his son Hunter who were his biggest supporters. Biden is said to value their counsel greatly and factored greatly into his decision. This comes after a wave of pressure from some Democratic Party operatives to see the president drop out. Proponents say that Biden is simply too old to mount an effective challenge to Trump, and while they say his presidency was a success, it's time to step down. Biden allies, meanwhile, state his debate performance was simply a bad night, and if the president did drop out, it could lead to Democratic infighting and possibly hurt their chances against Trump in the general election. Post-debate polls have been mixed, with some showing the president staying steady with Trump, while others show a downtick in support. Though it should be said that the polling is still early, and while Biden seems to be staying in the race today, bad polling and further pressure could still change his mind, in the future. In other election news, Iran held the first round of its presidential election on Friday and delivered a victory to the only reformist candidate in the race, Masoud Pazeshkian, who will now go to the runoff and face conservative Saeed Jalili, who came second. Pazeshkian, a 69-year-old heart surgeon, is not a radical reformer, 
but has criticised Iran's mandatory headscarf laws and wants to seek warmer relations with the West and restart nuclear negotiations. Saeed Jalili, on the other hand, is a hardliner who served as the famously uncompromising chief nuclear negotiator under former President Ahmadinejad, who advocates for confrontation with America, deeper engagement with Russia and China, and resists any social liberalisation. Turnout in the first round was low, just 40%, the lowest in the Islamic Republic's history. Given that low turnout usually benefits hardliners because it's usually disillusioned moderates not voting, the fact that Pazeshkian came first on a historically low turnout is notable. However, to win the runoff, which will be held this Friday the 5th of July, Pazeshkian will need to not only mobilise voters who didn't vote in the first round, but also try and win over voters who supported the third-place candidate, Mohamed Galabaf, a conservative but more moderate than Jalili, that won 14% of the vote. In other news, you might remember last week that we reported on the attempted coup in Bolivia. In a dramatic update to that story, Bolivia's president, Luis Arce, has been accused of orchestrating the failed coup against himself in order to boost his popularity, something he's angrily denied as lies. The allegation was actually first made by the coup's supposed leader, General Juan José Zuniga, who said, without evidence, just before being arrested, that the president had ordered him to carry out the mutiny to boost his popularity. But now the allegation is being made by Arce's former ally-turned-rival, ex-president Evo Morales, who had been one of the first powerful voices to denounce last week's attempted coup. On Sunday, Morales said, however, that Arce had, quote, "...disrespected the truth deceived us, lied not only to the Bolivian people, but to the whole world, adding that there should be an independent investigation into the military's actions. The comments add to the bitter rivalry between the two left-wing former allies, Arce and Morales. Back in 2019, Morales ran for an unconstitutional third term, winning the vote, which his opponent said was fraudulent, sparking protests that eventually saw Morales resign and flee the country. The right-wing opposition took control as an interim government, which Morales' party described as a coup. Elections were held in 2020 that saw Morales' ally, Luis Arce, elected president, but the pair have fallen out over Morales' plans to run again in 2025. The backdrop to this feud is a deep economic crisis in the landlocked South American country, which has only been made worse by political deadlock. And finally, in some uplifting news, Sierra Leone has passed legislation to ban child marriage, making it a criminal offence to marry anyone under 18. According to UNICEF, some 30% of girls and 4% of boys are married before the age of 18, and rates are even higher in rural areas. Human Rights Watch says the new law prohibits all forms of child marriage and cohabitation with a child, including aiding and abetting, protects the best interests of children and ensures affected girls have access to counselling and safeguarding. It's been hailed as a milestone in Sierra Leone's path towards gender equality and child protection, though there is still much progress to be made. Before we finish with today's briefing, I wanted to quickly tell you about a project that we're working on called Too Long. Too Long is our new physical magazine that we'll be releasing three times a year, running you through a whole bunch of key news events in more detail, and sometimes more intelligently than is possible on YouTube, with us able to choose the topics we think truly matter most and taking the time necessary to really explain them, rather than being constrained by algorithms or click-through rates like we are on YouTube. It's worth clarifying that this really is a serious, high-quality magazine that we're printing, full of interesting journalism and with graphics to bring the stories to life. The first edition we're working on is a UK election special, so it will run through the results of the election and discuss how the victors plan to rebuild Britain in a number of key policy areas. But the other half of the magazine is dedicated to news from around the world, including the European elections, France's snap election, Hungary's upcoming EU presidency, the ongoing wars in Ukraine and Gaza, the tensions between the US and China, Japan's poly crisis, and of course the US election. If you're interested and want to support the channel, we'd really appreciate it if you consider picking up a copy. Click the link in the description to learn more. Plus, if you use code TLDR daily, you'll get £2 off any order. Thanks for your support, and thanks for watching The Daily Briefing.